Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 280, recorded on February 15th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. This week, the Git project reminds us our software tools are never quite complete, with new releases that address a pair of security vulnerabilities. That's CVE 2023, 22490, and 23946. Yeah, let's start with that 22490 first. This is an issue that crops up when you're cloning a repository. So when you're when you're doing this, Git selects and uses a transport mechanism that's appropriate for the URL scheme of your clone. However, if you're doing a local repository, Git instead uses a separate local clone optimization technique to copy files directly from the source to the destination. Well, A specifically and specially crafted repository can trick Git into using its local clone optimization for a non-local transport. And in the right circumstances, and when you have a symbolic link for the top-level directory you're cloning, you can trigger a nasty bug. And then there's 23.946. Now, typically, Git allows for applying basically arbitrary patches to your repository using Git apply. But To prevent malicious patches from creating files outside of your working directory, GitApply will reject any patches which attempt to write a file that's sitting behind a symbolic link. However, this mechanism can be tricked when the malicious patch creates a symbolic link itself. This can then be leveraged to write arbitrary files on a victim's file system if you happen to apply malicious patches from untrusted sources. Mm hmm. Also worth noting, uh, the bugs and the fixes themselves were found and created by a couple of folks at GitLab and at GitHub. Kind of a nice little uh, kumbaya there. You got to just love how open source works sometimes. Now go install your updates. Well, we don't want to make you feel old, but this week, it's the 10 year anniversary of Steam on Linux. Valve's announcement reminds us just how much times have changed, writing way back on February 14th, 2013, quote, The Steam client is now available to download for free from the Ubuntu Software Center. Oh, yes. Oh, boy, does that bring back memories. And it hasn't really been a straight line from the beta, which was even before February 14th, 2013, to where we're at now. We've had lots of rabbit holes like Steam Machines, the Steam Controller, tweaks to the development strategy, and of course, years now that have been invested into Proton to kind of really bring it all together. But I think we can say 10 years plus into this, we can really kind of see a cohesive picture coming together, especially in the last couple of years. And how far we've come, because I remember just an intense amount of skepticism in the months leading up to Valve's announcement of even the beta. I can remember a conversation really clearly from Linux Action Show Season 22, Episode 8, that Brian and I had on July 11th, 2012. Man, everything coming out of Phronix dealing with Valve is so fast and loose. It's like I don't... I get so excited about the idea of Steam coming to Linux. I'm starting to believe it a little more, just because they they did hire a well-known Linux kernel developer. This guy did test a performance bug fix for GL. You know where a lot of Linux kernel developers work? Microsoft. Well, okay. I mean, they work all over the place, I know. There's Linux kernel devs at Microsoft. And there's been rumors that Valve's working on a hardware box based on Linux, maybe like an on-live competitor kind of thing that would run You know where there's other people who work on Linux? Hmm. Amazon. Yeah, doesn't mean anything. Like, I, 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 I so I, much want this to be real. But a game development shop, I just want to believe, Brian. I want to believe. I just, ah, yeah. Anyway, I really want to believe it. I, I feel like Pharonix's strategy is say it enough times into the universe, <laughs> and it'll just happen. <laughs> well, I hope so. And, I hope that works. And I just, I just, yeah, I just don't. Buy um. It. Also, apparently, uh, Valve is hiring uh, Linux developers right now. They have positions open for Linux developers. We'll see. We'll see. You're not saying it's impossible. You're just saying skeptical Brian is skeptical, right? Well, I'm saying that there's absolutely no reason to think that it's happening other than Pharonix declares that it is and Valve will not confirm anything. And my dreams. And your dreams. And That's dreams. true. Yeah. And honestly, Chris's dreams are Powerful. pretty much... Powerful. I know, right? Ironclad. I, I know. Too bad I always just dream about traffic. And you didn't have to wait too long to find out. In the very next episode 
Season 22, Episode 9, Valve made their plans public. Now, of course, the top story on the news docket this week is last week, Monday, after the big show came out, Valve posted on their blog an official announcement that they were developing Steam for Linux, and they called it Steamed Penguins. This is also the announcement of their new blog, Big Things Have Small Beginnings was one of their titles. Now, of course, we talked about this on the, on the uh, show last week, but uh, it turned out it was all true. And someone who's been following the story from the very beginning, from what I call even Square Zero, is Michael from Phronics.com. And he joins us on the line right now to talk about this big story. Michael, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Chris. Uh, how are you doing? You, uh, you, have, you have an idea, but you can't really share much with us, that there might be more than just Steam, the desktop client, and more than just Left 4 Dead, the game, but a bigger Linux play on top of all of that. Um, well, as Mike Sartain pointed out in his blog post, beyond Left 4 Dead 2, they do plan to pour many more games over to Linux. And as you have seen from some of the blog posts elsewhere, they do have job openings for hardware engineers, device driver engineers. Right, right. They are working with Intel and AMD on open source graphics drivers, etc. They have many good things planned for the future. Oh man, the Steam beta was such a hot topic for a long time. And so many different ways to figure out if your machine could run any of the Steam games. And something else I can remember really clearly was the discussion around Valve focusing on Ubuntu initially. I recall asking Michael Larble from Pharonix almost like 11 years ago now, maybe it was 12 years ago, is this going to be a problem for Valve and Steam on Linux going forward? Um, no, not at all. I made it very clear back in April when talking with Gabe and with Max Artain and the others that basically, obviously it makes sense to focus on Ubuntu in the beginning because Ubuntu is obviously the most popular Linux distribution, including der- derivatives like Linux Mint. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously overall, if they put out a simple ChargeZ package from their different Linux distributors, can obviously package it and do whatever the hell they want, and it will work out fine. And you will see they will not be targeting ex- explicitly Ubuntu. That takes me back to a special time. And it's really quite fun to watch the story unfold across a few episodes of the Linux Action Show. If you'd like to get your nostalgia on, we'll have those linked in the notes. Canonical got real with us this week, real time, nearly one year after they shipped the beta version of the Ubuntu real-time kernel. They've promoted it to a general availability status, and it happened to be on Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, indeed. Ubuntu's real-time kernel is based on the Linux 5.15 LTS kernel, much like the Ubuntu 2204.1 kernel. But, crucially, it carries the out-of-tree preempt RT patch set. Yeah, I think this is probably worth underscoring here. The upstream work from the recently acquired Linutronics group isn't done yet. Their new owners, Intel, will likely get the patches fully upstream before the end of the year because we've been watching that work, and recently it has been making good progress, but it's not there yet. Exactly. And, of course, it is relatively common for downstream distribution makers to apply patches before upstream considers them fully baked. For better, or for worse. Well, you gotta have that value add. Now, by generally available, what that means to Canonical is that you'll need to be an Ubuntu Pro customer to get your hands on this, or an enterprise customer running Ubuntu Core 22 with an app store. Then you can install the real-time kernel. I actually think that's a pretty reasonable idea to just sort of gate how widely deployed this becomes. After all, it's a fairly specific use case for these patches. Things are moving in Linux desktop land. And a new GTK blog post summarizes a recent developer meetup at Fosdom. The group discussed general improvements for the GTK toolkit and starting the transition to GTK 5. The current consensus seems to be opening up GTK 4.90 development following the GTK 4.12 release. That would put it towards the end of this year and three years after the initial 4.0, which actually seems pretty darn reasonable. If you work with GTK, the entire post is really worth a read. And of course, we'll have a link in the notes. 
linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account and go there to support the show. Linode is fast and reliable cloud hosting with great support. I think the best support in the business with real humans available all day, every day. The pricing's fantastic as well. They're 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers that want to lock into their platforms. But for us, it means we can have more infrastructure. We can operate and look like the big boys out there at a price that a small business can afford. And they have 11 data centers around the world for you to choose from. They're spinning up another dozen this week. And they all feature great, great things like object storage that's S3 compatible, a cloud firewall that prevents the traffic from ever getting to your rig, easy to understand backups that are super quick to restore, and Kubernetes support if you want to pop it all into your over, overall infrastructure. So go try it right now. See why we love it so much. Go see why so many Jupyter Broadcasting listeners have switched to Linode and stuck with it. It's the only place we'll deploy our production infrastructure. Go build something. Go learn something. Try it for yourself and support the show. Linode's what we use, and I think you're going to love it. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there. Get the 100 bucks. Support the show. It's Linode.com slash L-A-N. And thanks to Collide. Collide.com slash LAN. Our sponsor, Collide, has some big news. If you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet to 100% compliance. How? If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud applications until they've fixed the problem. It's that simple. Collide patches one of the major holes in Zero Trust architecture, device compliance. Without Collide, IT can struggle to solve basic problems like keeping everyone's OS and browser up to date. Unsecured devices are logging into your company's apps because there's nothing there to stop them. Collide is the only device trust solution that enforces compliance as part of authentication. And it's built to work seamlessly with Okta. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set amount of time, they're blocked. Collide's method means fewer support tickets, less frustration, and most importantly, 100% fleet compliance. Visit collide.com slash LAN to learn more or to book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. KDE developers released the much-anticipated Plasma 5.27 this week. It's a long-term support version and also the last major release in the Plasma 5 series. It features a new welcome wizard, new settings for managing flat packs, incredible improvements to the multi-monitor system, Wayland improvements, of course, which we'll touch on, and then there is that one prominent headline feature everyone seems to be talking about. It's a significant workflow improvement for tiling desktop fans, and I count myself one of them. This feature is now live, but hidden away in the desktop effects settings screen. It'll allow you to create custom tile layouts and resize adjacent tiled windows simultaneously. Tucked away it is, for sure. Uh, once you do have it enabled, though, you can activate it by holding down the shift key while dragging a window. And then if you hold down the super key and you press T, you can adjust and create custom tile layouts. The UI is clean. It's really just enough to get the job done. Uh, in fact, the overall set of features here, I think, has some room for improvement. Like, it'd be nice to save your layouts. That'd be useful. But as an MVP that ships in 527, I'm kind of thrilled with it. And then there is KWIN. My goodness, KWIN saw an astronomical amount of updates in 527. I mean, just the simple list of changes is 644 lines long. Discover got some love this time around, too. The homepage has seen a redesign showing the most popular applications along the top. And if you're a Steam Deck user, check this out. Discover now supports updating the console directly. Under the hood, Discover saw some fixes to handling RPM OS tree systems, a litany of Flatpak updates, an increase in startup parallelization, and, in most cases, less overall memory usage. Wes, I'm not kidding. Just reading the changelog of the Discover app made me appreciate how hard of a job Discover has when you consider all the different ways to install software on Linux. I'm not going to give it a hard time ever again. It may not be my favorite app, 
but I totally underappreciated the job they have. And I got that sense reading so many of the change logs here. And then there's the UI improvements that are just everywhere. The Breeze theme itself saw some nice improvements. Honestly, we could spend this entire episode just covering that stuff. But if I was if I was forced to just pick a few favorites, I think the updates to K-Runner would be at the top of my list. I mean, besides refining its look and its color support and whatnot, and which I think looks just a little bit slicker, the thing gains some serious time zone superpowers, which is going to be helpful daily. And the devs have tweaked the search results so that the most relevant ones appear at the top. And here's just like a random thing that you just like to see. All your CPU cores will be used now to generate dynamic wallpapers when you select them. And okay, my point is... The improvements in this release are so extensive that they span such a massive range throughout, from headline bangers like tiling window management to faster wallpaper generation. The system tray area, the panel, and many other Plasma widgets have seen this release's attention as well, making 527 the kind of Plasma desktop you could move into and be happy staying for a while. Many of the widgets gain the ability to pass along a little more information, too. Like the Bluetooth widget? Well, it'll show the battery status of connected devices if you hover the cursor over it. And the system monitor, both the widget and the app, can now detect monitor power usage for NVIDIA GPUs. Pretty slick. Now, it's almost a little cliche at this point to say with a new Plasma release, but it's definitely valid with 527. Wayland's support has been greatly improved, with a whole bunch of bug fixes and reliability improvements throughout. For example, the desktop environment? It's now better able to automatically choose appropriate scale factors for your screens, so you don't have to go fuss with that manually. And Plasma on Wayland? It's gained support for the Global Shortcuts Portal. This allows apps on Wayland to offer a standardized user interface for setting and editing Global Shortcuts. I already have it up and running. On the computer in front of me, of course, uh, I have KD Neon, and it continues to just be a great way to try the latest Plasma. But you don't have to distro hop. Distributions like Arch and Tumbleweed and Nix and others will have the 527 packages hitting their repos between right now and the next few weeks. And in the grand scheme of things, a few weeks is relatively quick because you can expect KDE Plasma 527 to receive updates until 2024 as the project begins to work and release Plasma 6, which, of course, we'll keep an eye on that and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source software. So go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact to let us know what your favorite 527 feature is. And celebrate Coder 500 over at the Jupiter Garage. JupiterGarage.com, the robe, the tumbler, and the sticker are on sale for a limited time. As for us, well, we'll be back here next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week. Music.